So now that we've looked in a little bit more detail at heuristic biases, uh, let's now turn our attention to the second theme, uh, which is frame reference or frame dependence. So frame dependence is really where to store the assets, right? And when we're looking at where to store the assets, it's dependent on the frame we look through. Think of it this way, all right? If you've got looking through a, a piece of glass and it's perfectly crystal clear and you can see right through, you can see, you know, the sky and the sun and the birds and everything and you can get a really crystal clear picture of what's on the other side of the pane of glass, all right? In the financial world, that pane of glass is not transparent, it's more opaque. So you can sort of see various images, you can see that it's blue, you can see something sort of moving across the sky. You're not exactly sure if that's a bird or a plane or a helicopter or what it is. Um, you can sort of see there's a couple of bushes and trees and that they're, they're green and there's some grass out there and there might be a pond over there. Um, but you can't exactly tell. All right. Now, we're all looking through different panes of this opaque glass. So once you've got your piece of opaque glass, you might say, that was a bird. I'm going to go, well, that actually looks like a plane to me. The bird versus the plane type reference, that's an opaque piece of, piece of glass, and that's really the frame dependence. What frame are we looking through is going to determine what we infer is happening on the other side of the glass, because in finance, we don't have access to all information. It's not as if we know what's going on inside the CEO's brain. It's not as if we know what's happening in the boardroom. It's not as if we know where's, what sales are going on in Europe. When we haven't chatted to the vice president of sales and marketing, we don't know what's coming down the pipe in terms of research and development and how the technologies are going. All we can do is listen to conference calls, get the odd interview with the CEO, and from that, we can base our reference or, or our information on that frame that we've created ourselves. Um, so our frames are very opaque, and that means that you get a different answer to what I do. Obviously, we've got a relatively good understanding of what's going on there, but we'll never have that crystal clear piece of glass where we can see everything that's happening. So this is frame dependence, and really what it is, is we're trying to get it's an informed decision rather than all the information. It's just informed based on all the bits and pieces that we can put together to make a decision. So let's have a look at some of the frames through which people look to make their investment decisions. The first frame is loss aversion. Now loss aversion is really what we're trying to look at here is how do people react to certain degrees of uncertainty and certain levels of risk. And what has been discovered over the years, and I'm sure every, well, 99% of people are exactly the same, they're far more afraid of losing than they are of a major gain. So what happens is if you make $1,000 on a stock, or if you lose $1,000 on a stock, and you're given a person an option for an investment, there's a 50% chance that you can make a thousand or lose a thousand. A lot of people don't take that um, that investment because of there's a chance that they might lose a thousand dollars, which might be over and above their risk thresholds. They just don't want to lose. They're always focusing on that loss side of things rather than the upside. And this is one of the reasons where people cut their losses. Uh, their, sorry, their their um, profits short, and they let their losses run, which of course is the complete wrong thing to do. Uh, if anyone who's a professional in this game knows, um, as soon as you've got a loss on your stock, you typically try and cut that as soon as possible. Your loss at the beginning is going to be far smaller than it is later on. But your amateur investor typically leaves that, that stock just to keep on its downward you know, spiral and continue to rack up losses because they're not a loss until I sell the stock. Um, well, any professional knows that that's not the case. It's losing money. You get, you're going to have to sell it at some point. There's no guarantee that it's going to come back. So the better option is just to cut it here and maybe buy it back at a point that's a lot cheaper and just save all that heartache and pain in the interim. Plus, of course, we have to report our results and our numbers to our investors on a monthly basis. So letting a stock run into deep negative territory, that's going to be reported as a loss. That's going to drag down your portfolio, maybe make the whole portfolio a negative month. And your investors don't want to see that. So you learn very quickly you need to cut those losses. 
On the flip side, all of your investors as a professional are waiting to see, you know, the upside. They want to see a huge big move up. They want to see up 10% in a month, for example. Um, I'm in the hedge fund game, so these numbers are what people are interested in seeing. I've got to let those ponies that are winning the race win. Um, what a lot of people do, if you want to put it in a horse race context, they've got the winning ticket, their horse is winning, they've only, they're halfway through the race, and they go, okay, well, that's good enough, and they crumple up the ticket and throw it away. Why not let that horse finish? Um, whereas what they're doing with the one that's coming dead last, they're holding on to that ticket and going, oh, please come on, please come on, please come on. You know, you can't do it that way. It's just not the done thing. But when you look at it in terms of frame reference and you're saying, what exactly is going to affect my clients and what's going to affect the general population? And really what affects them two and a half times more than anything is losing money. They just don't want to lose money. So they will take investments that they can be assured that they'll make money rather than lose money. And this is a big frame reference for most of your clients and most investors out there in the market. So the, the other interesting thing to note on this loss aversion is that when we look at things from a technical basis, all right, so you've got a technical analysis and you've got a line of resistance, which we all know a stock comes down and it bounces up and it hits this line and it bounces back down and it hits the line again and bounces back down. It's a line of resistance. A lot of that, the technical trading strategies, come from this loss aversion where people have lost money on the stock and it gets back to break even. Yahoo, I can get out for losing no money, so they sell. And this is really what's creating the support or the levels of resistance. Um, same thing on the support side. If the stock, you buy the stock here, it runs up, comes back down, you sell quickly before you lose any money, all right? And there's going to be buyers because they say, right, we can buy into this stock because right now that's where we bought and we were up before. So that's a lot of what's happening with this loss aversion is also, you know, it, it comes out in technical analysis and that's one of the reasons for a benefit in technical analysis. That's just sort of a sidebar, but just to give you a frame of reference.